Good evening, everyone. Um, the warmest of welcomes from the from the British Library, and thank you all for for attending. I'm I'm John Lee. I head up the British Library Book Publishing Division. Um, welcome to this evening, celebrating the the craft and the history of crime fiction. Uh, we're also looking at the publication of two absolutely fantastic books in recent weeks. Um, one is Martin Edwards's Life of Crime, um, and the other is Reverend Richard Cold's Murder Before Evening's Evensong. Um, all of these books, and indeed the 100th crime classic, which is Death of a Bookseller, um, are available from the tab at the top of the screen, as are indeed um, all of the crime classics on Three for Twos and the brand new published British Library crime classic Crook Loon by ECR Lorac, all from the British Library shop. The British Library crime classic series has now published its 100th volume, uh, which is Death of a Bookseller by Bernard Farmer. As part of that process, the publishing team just wanted to, as a warm up, introduce the series by means of a few curious statistics um, of what has happened in those well, is it eight years since the first volumes were published in 2014. And we've done that by means of some statistics and I just wanted to give you them. They're put together by Johnny Davidson, who is our in-house editor for the series and is um, you know, a publishing magician in terms of how he manages to put these together, working with myself and indeed series editor, Martin. So just to sort of get us rolling, here's a few of the, the statistics. We have um, a total of 38 authors. If you include all the short stories, we have 171 separate writers in the series. The number of anthologies of short stories edited by Martin is 19. Uh, there are 11 authors writing as pseudonyms, which actually makes up a quarter of the entire series writing as pseudonyms. Uh, there are 11 women authors for the novels, and there are then in total 36 women writers if you include short stories. Uh, we have traced down 12 author estates that we didn't, you know, that, that are not represented anywhere else and actually made, brought those authors back into print and revived their work. Uh, we have found 39 separate lost books, ones that only had a first edition and then are being brought back into print um, through the British Library. We've published eight British Library crime classics. We've published 20 impossible crime locked room mysteries and a total of 278 short stories. There's only one mystery featuring the real life Arsenal football team. There are five separate Santa Claus, either as suspects or victims. The year that the most novels were published were actually shared between 1934 and 1938, sorry, 36 with eight each. Uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, the decade in which the most novels were published were the 1930s with 46 titles. Uh, with a close, well, not a close second, but a, a second up with the 1940s with a total of 17 titles. Uh, there is one Death by Jellyfish in the series. Uh, there is one classic manuscript recovered that had never been published in the, in the first place by ACR Lorac, which is her two-way murder. There's one joint husband and wife authorship team, which is Nat Lombard's Murders of Swine. And there's only one author descended from William the Conqueror is Rupert Latimer. Uh, the total stories and novels are 360, and we've sold over a million paperbacks into the UK market, and then you know, a number of different international languages as well. So with that set of statistics, I'm delighted to hand over to Laura, who's going to introduce our guest for this evening. Uh, good evening. I'm Laura Wilson. I'm a crime fiction writer and The Guardian's crime fiction reviewer, and I'm going to be chairing this event. Now the crime genre is, these days at least, a very broad church. And of course, there are trends in crime fiction as there are in anything else. And in recent years, Nordic noir and domestic noir, to name but two. And then over it all, the pendulum swings from hard boiled to soft boiled and back again. For example, we had the huge and unexpected success of Alexander McCall Smith's number one ladies detective agency, which was published in 1998 and was seen as a reaction to mainstream crime novels becoming increasingly violent and gruesome. But right now, although there are good sales in all areas of the genre, the gentler and more ludic, if you like, end of the crime fiction inspection is having another moment. Um, there have been stratospheric sales, 
for Richard Osman's The Thursday Murder Club titles. And of course, there are plenty of reissues of Golden Age authors, as well as the ones on the wonderful British Library list. And we'll be discussing possible reasons for this and the appeal of the modern cosy, as well as of Golden Age crime later on. Now to the personnel. As well as being the consultant to this highly successful series of gems from British crime fiction's past, Martin Edwards is an astonishingly prolific and award-winning crime author. He's written over 20 novels and 70 short stories. He's widely recognized as really leading the way as an authority on the genre. Um, and he's the author of the acclaimed study, The Golden Age of Murder, as well as a second study, The Life of Crime, which is detecting the history of mysteries and their creators. It was published in May this year by Collins. Martin is also president of the Detection Club, about which I think we'll probably hear a bit more later on, as well as being a former chair of the Crime Writers Association. And in 2020, he was the very deserving recipient of its highest accolade, which is the Diamond Dagger. The Reverend Richard Coles needs very little introduction from me, I think, formerly half of the synth pop duo, the Communards, whose dance version of Don't Leave Me This Way went to number one in the summer of 1986. It was one of my favorite songs. Um, he's a writer, a broadcaster, strictly come dancing and celebrity master chef alumnus. And for the past 11 years, he's been the victor of Findon in Northamptonshire. He retired from the church this Easter for a new life in Sussex penning books that may well become future crime classics. Murder Before Evensong, the first in a projected series featuring Canon Daniel Clement, rector of Champton St. Mary, was published earlier this month by Weidenfeld and Nicholson and is storming up book charts. So without further ado, I will hand over to Martin Edwards, who's going to talk a bit about the British Library crime classics list. Well, thanks very much indeed, uh, Laura, and it's great to be with you, with Richard, and, and with all our uh, uh, participants uh, online in this session. Uh, John said rightly that the uh, uh, Crime Classic series really got going in 2014. And in fact, my uh, involvement, my association with the series dates back uh, just a little earlier to uh, the middle of 2013, when I had a chance conversation over coffee with uh, John's predecessor uh, in the publications department here at the British Library. We had a cup of coffee, we, we chatted about books and crime fiction generally, uh, uh, Rob Davis and I, and he told me about um, his ideas for future projects. And in fact, the British Library had had the idea previously of uh, publishing 19th century uh, crime classics, and a number of those have been published. Uh, titles such as The Notting Hill Mystery by Charles Felix and uh, Revelations of a Lady Detective, which perhaps slightly less racy than the title suggests. And uh, those, those books uh, were very interesting historically, but uh, perhaps hadn't made quite the impact uh, uh, that was hoped for. So the library had shifted to the 1930s and published three books by uh, a little known author from the golden age uh, called Mavis Doriel Hay. And the, the third of these was a book called The Santa Claus Murder. And this is the original cover. And Rob told me that that book uh, uh, was, was due to be uh, published shortly, but that he'd had an idea for relaunching the series. And uh, what he planned to do was to have uh, fresh introductions to little known uh, stories from the 20s, 30s, 40s, and so on. And a new look to the series because covers do, uh, whether writers love it or not, covers do sell books. And he, he, he'd had the idea of uh, using vintage railway poster artwork. Uh, for the covers and he explained this to me it all sounded very interesting and the uh, very convivial conversation ended with Rob inviting me to contribute two introductions to the uh, next two books in the series and one of those was the Cornish Coast Murder by John Bude uh, then a really a forgotten author uh, long forgotten. He died in the 1950s and hadn't really been reprinted at all. Uh, and the other was The Lake District Murder, also by uh, John Bude. So I wrote my introduction, sent them off to Rob. He was happy. The books uh, uh, were uh, uh, 
put into production. And the next thing I knew was that I had an excited message from Rob saying that the sales had really taken off. The pre-orders, uh, the booksellers, Waterstones and many independent bookshops were really getting behind the series and uh, it, it was really quite astonishing what, what, what had happened and of course I, I would love to think it's it's the wonderfully well-informed introductions but in fact of course the covers uh, were all important that's the Cornish Coast murder this is the uh, Lake District murder and these um, these vintage uh, railway posters used as artwork on the books really made them very attractive. They were very well produced in any event. And the sales absolutely, from, from a relatively low base, uh, uh, took off. And, and it, I think it's fair to say that the crime classics have never looked back. Um, so these books were published in early 2014. In the Christmas of that year, um, a little known Christmas mystery was published, Mystery in White by another long forgotten author, J. Jefferson Farjung. And that sold a colossal number, over 100,000. It outsold Gone Girl by, by Gillian Flynn, the great modern dom domestic noir uh, author. So it was clear that something was going on. And uh, uh, the series uh, gathered ahead of steam and that has continued to this day. And as John has said, um, we've recently passed 100 books with Death of a Bookseller uh, by Bernard J. Farmer who was a part-time policeman as well as a, uh, a bibliophile. And uh, it, it's really been quite a, a wonderful and exhilarating uh, experience to be, to be part of it. And my role uh, as consultant, uh, Rob appointed me as consultant and, and John uh, has, has kept me on in that role uh, uh, to date. My role has, has really been to act as a sounding board for ideas when suggestions come in, to make suggestions of my own about particular authors, particular books that I think might, uh, might fit well into the series, such as John Dixon Carr, The King of What True Mystery, uh, ECR Lorac, uh, uh, John has already mentioned, uh, an author who's a great uh, favourite of mine and indeed of my parents, would have been out of print for 60 years. Well, those books have been incredibly successful. And one of the great pleasures has been uh, not just to reprint those books, but to find a lost manuscript. And it was this book that uh, John mentioned, uh, Two Way Murder, which had never been published before. So the British Library is, I think, doing great service, not just in resurrecting titles that deserve to be brought back, to modern readers, uh, but, but also in, in this case, uh, uh, introducing a book that's never been published at all, ever. Uh, and it's a 1950s book and it still reads very well to this day and it's, it's been uh, very well received by the readers. And I think it's quite interesting, and we may uh, perhaps talk a bit more about this to, to wonder what the, what the secret is uh, of the success. Uh, clearly the cover artwork does play a part. The, the books are very collectible, and I know many people who've collected all all 100 uh, and counting uh, books in the series, and they, they, they look rather beautiful on the shelves, because uh, you do need several shelves now for this number of books. Uh, the anthologies um, that John mentioned, uh, 19 uh, so far, and again, more in, in the works. An example is, is this one, uh, murder by the Book, uh, Mysteries for Bibliophiles, stories about books and authors and publishers. Uh, uh, and that, that one has done particularly well. And one of the things I've been very keen to advocate as, as a fan, as well as a novelist, is, is to try to showcase the sheer variety. Laura's already talked about this, the sheer variety of the crime genre. And that variety is, is not a new thing. It's always been a very broad church, the crime fiction genre. And I think this is one of its great strengths that as, as one particular subgenre may fall out of fashion for, a, for a, a period of years, another one comes along and, and, and that keeps it fresh and keeps renewing uh, enthusiasm for the genre. And so you get the classic whodunits like the the Poison Chocolates case, one of my personal favourites by Anthony Barclay and, and the British Library. And this is a book with six solutions. The British Library uh, uh, agreed to reprint uh, a seventh solution 
by Christiana Brand, who then uh, invited me to contribute an eight solution, which was uh, a, a really fun thing to do, one, one of my all time favorite tasks. And it's quite interesting, I think, to see the, uh, the revival of some of those earlier books, which might not have sold quite so well uh, initially, but the Santa Claus murder has now, in its, in its new incarnation, with, with an, uh, uh, a cover in the same style, has, uh, has done exceptionally well. But that mix of stories that, that I mentioned is very important. So in addition to having the very traditional mysteries, the, there are books that you might not necessarily accept, books that are certainly far from cosy. Uh, a very good example, I think, is Due to a Death by Mary Kelly, uh, a, a, quite a bleak book, but uh, uh, written by a very distinguished uh, uh, woman writer who died a few years ago, but who won a gold dagger for the Spoilt Kill, which is also in the series. And I think that including this, this diversity of style of, of novel, of crime story, to show that it, it, it's not just one thing, the crime genre, it's a whole mix of, of different authors, different settings, different methods by which they tell uh, their tales. I think this is part of the enduring appeal. I was asked a few years ago to write a companion volume to the series. Uh, this is it. It's the story of classic crime in, in 100 books. And, and that's an attempt to look at uh, the first half century of the 20th century and to tell the story of the evolution of the genre from the Hound of the Baskervilles to Strangers on a Train by Patricia Highsmith. And you see just in those two titles, the sheer, uh, not just the, the evolution, but the, the range of types of story that, that this wonderful genre that we all love uh, can encompass. So, so I must say in, in closing that, uh, that my association with the uh, British Library and with this series has been uh, quite unexpected from my perspective, but it's been a great joy. It's been uh, enormous fun from that, that first cup of coffee with Rob Davis to working with John and Johnny and their colleagues uh, right now. So uh, I think that we have a lot of exciting ideas and titles in the pipeline. And uh, I'm certainly hoping that this series will indeed go from strength to strength and all the signs are that it will. I'm sure that's right. Thank you very much, Martin. And we will be coming back to the Golden Age a bit later on. Um, but first, I'd like to ask um, the Reverend Richard Coles to talk about his crime novel, his debut, Murder Before Even Song. Um, now, to give you a flavour of this, The Observer described it as charming and funny. And Jake Kerridge in The Telegraphs mentions your splendidly caustic wit and says that you rival Barbara Pym, no less, in your ability to make no low stakes conflict gripping. Although of course the stakes turn out to be much higher than we originally think. Um, and I have to say one thing I particularly loved about the book was the descriptions of the quiet moments that Daniel spends as it were with God in the church. Um, I loved the balance of that with the other elements of the book and because it made me completely believe in the character. Um, could you maybe just tell us a bit about the book, the characters, the plot, and where the idea came from? Clearly, sure. the apple didn't fall too far from the tree. <laughs> oh, well, no, it seems, um, well, kind of yes and no. Well, it sort of, the, the story begins, so we're in Champton St. Mary, it's 1988. I wanted particularly to set a book towards the end of the 19. 80s, although I don't, I'm not too explicit about that. Um, I don't make that very obvious to begin with. Um, and it's a familiar setting. It's an English village with an ancient church and a lovely rectory. And there Daniel Clement, Canon Clement lives with his mother, Audrey, and their two Dachshunds, Cosmo and Hilda. Um, there's a small village with a large estate and an aristocratic and grand family, the De Fleurs who live there. So all that stuff is familiar, I think. And then one day, Daniel in church announces a plan to install a lavatory in church. And that sets in, uh, sets up a sort of chain of events which lead to murder and mayhem. 
and uh, Daniel has to figure out why and try to put it all back together again. And it began actually with me announcing in church one Sunday that we were planning to install a new lavatory, which you'd think would be an innocent and sort of innocuous thing to do because our, um, our sanitary needs were not adequately catered for. And nobody got murdered, but it did lead to the biggest row I think I've ever presided over in a church, apart from one in my previous parish, which was over whether you should have one bite or two bites of mince pies after the carol service. These seem like trivial things, and indeed they are, but they connect to deeper things. And I think one of the things that fascinates me about church life, why I'm very flattered to be even in the same sentence as Barbara Pitt, is we bring stuff to churches, important stuff. As Philip Larkin said, who was not a man renowned for piety, a serious house on serious earth it is. And I think there we, you know, the devices and desires of the human heart, as the Book of Common Prayer puts it, bubble away. And they become places where we work out really deep and powerful and sometimes violent uh, and uh, angry impulses. And I'm always fascinated by it. I've always liked uh, that sort of bubbling up in crime fiction. And, um, and I decided to have a go. Okay, now you have written a bit about being a clergyman before in, in your memoirs, but this is based, it's, it's feature in truth, if you like, but it's fic. Why, now why fiction and why crime particularly? Well, partly because like every parish priest, I've nurtured fantasies of murdering my parishioners. So that was an opportunity to <laughs> have, um, indulge that. Um, not all of them and not, and I'd like to not really do it, obviously, with fantasies. Yeah. But partly also because I just love crime fiction. I've read it all my life. The first proper book I ever got given me by my grandfather was the complete Sherlock Holmes short stories. And I think from a, I was about eight, I think. And very early on, I was just captivated by this idea of this kind of odd, um, extraordinary, unusual, strange, somehow even a tiny bit sinister character who had this extraordinary ability to look at a pattern that to another would look undisturbed and unremarkable and see in it meaning. And that fascinated me. And funnily enough, I found once I was ordained and getting involved in parish ministry, I was having to do the same thing, that you're looking at the surface of things and you'll see just a tiny kink in the pattern and from that you will have to kind of work out what's going on and that helps to explain the impulses and the rage and the misunderstanding. I should say my older brother is a detective, is a retired detective now in the Metropolitan Police and it was surprising how often we would check in with each other in the course of our very different careers looking for those disruptions in patterns and seeing what they told us about communities and people and the wild. That's interesting. Was he helpful to you? Your well, brother? really helpful. I thought yeah. he'd be helpful in sort of police procedural stuff, but then I realised yeah. I wasn't really interested in police procedural stuff. I didn't really understand it. But it was really just looking about where you develop, how you develop experience, mm. how you form judgments, how by looking at patterns and the disruptions and perhaps their resolutions, you begin to understand how the mysterious behaviour of people um, begins to make some sort of sense, I think. Yes, I think actually with the with novel with an amateur sleuth, it's better not to have too much police business. You just say at the end, the police turned up and they were very efficient. Then it's, it is so boring. Fine. Yeah. And, and yeah. also like most, of, like most of everything is so boring, isn't yeah. it? If you were writing vicar procedural, that too would be yeah. sort of pretty dull, filling in oh. your statistics for mission. You know? Yes, although there was, I found that fascinating as well. There was quite a lot of vicar procedure, which I rather enjoyed, and I learned new words, and I thought that was very, that was rather good, that it was there's all somebody, carefully knitted somebody, in there. Oh, well, well, somebody said that there can't be many crime novels published this year with the word narthex in them, which is, which is perhaps true. But, I think uh, that's probably um, quite likely that there aren't. Yes, I had to look that one up. <laughs> but um. I, I think it's interesting that one thing I've just noticed in my uh, ministry is very few people are interested in Christian doctrine. Fewer and fewer people recognize a hymn. Fewer and fewer people want to sit through a sermon, but they seem to be irreducibly fascinated in people who do it, vicars in particular. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's just something that's written so deeply into our cultural memory that somehow, you know, somebody toothy with a dog collar turning up um, continues to interest people. Partly, I think it's because we have a confessor role and I think one of the reasons 
why perhaps vicars do make detectives is because people tell us things. It happens even if I sit on a train in a dog collar, someone will start talking and often they will reveal stuff, which I think is more than they intended to reveal. And perhaps it's the dog collar acts as a sort of lightning conductor for stuff that trouble. I had someone, I was in Abingdon in an Indian restaurant a little while ago and fell into conversation with somebody. The most extraordinary story emerged. It was so fascinating. My chicken dancing was stone cold by the time I got back to it. Mm. Occupational hazard. Yes, I, I, well, I imagine it is. And actually the other occupational hazard, which had never occurred to me before, which you mentioned when um, Daniel goes into a shop to get a pencil eraser, which he says very carefully instead of saying a rubber, because he's very aware that the, the vicar is always this target for humorists, which I should think that probably is something that makes you want to kill people really quite a lot, isn't it? That it's I sort of the first line of the joke or whatever, that the vicar yeah. is in the bar or the something. A journalist friend of mine said, yeah. the problem with you lot is that vicar's rhymes with knickers. And I think that that's true. So we are only a step away from situation and comedy and also being ridiculous. But actually there's something to be said for being ridiculous. And I rather like those characters, not just in crime fiction, but in all sorts of fiction who appear to be ridiculous and sort of blink owlishly from behind their glasses and turn out actually to be quite steady and thoughtful. And the other thing is compassionate. I think, I think the crime fiction I like most is crime fiction which gives thoughtful weight and dignity to people who are often treated either as kind of, I love Marjorie Allingham is that she's really interested in what the char thinks. Mm. And I love that. Mm. And um, I also think in your, in your books, Martin, if I say so, I think you have this very steady compassion for people. And I've just noticed it with people who ever get involved in the criminal justice system, it's hard not to, because you realize that all sorts of people's lives go astray. Um, for reasons which seem so haphazard and so, um, in a way, not blameless exactly, but I've spent a lot of my time in, in ministry in prisons and, uh, you know, drug dealers look like drug dealers, armed robbers look like armed robbers, but lifers kind of look like anyone and everyone. And often you'll find talking to someone first that in the background of their own lives, which may have produced terrible offending, is often them having suffered um, themselves, often abusing care or something. But the other thing is you think if you'd been 20 minutes early or turned left instead of right, you wouldn't be here. Yes. Maybe I, maybe I would, you know. Yes. Well, that was actually something that uh, in the Rue in the Times of your book that Joan Smith picked up, she called it moral clarity. And I, I think, I mean, there's a, a long and honourable tradition of uh, clergymen, usually sleuths, thinking of Chesterton's Father Brown, and then you've got James Runce's um, Sidney Chambers, who's, who's C of E. And the, the only woman I could think of was um, Phil Rickman's Merrily Watkins, who's also an yeah. exorcist, which must come in quite handy. Um, and there's um, Harry Kemmelman did the rabbi, Rabbi Smallman, and there are a few nuns as well, and Brother Cadvile. And I think I don't know if any of the one of those particularly inspired you, but when I was thinking about it, I was thinking actually, not only do you have spiritual authority, you're able to talk to people from all walks of life, but you also are able to give absolution, aren't you? And and I think somewhere deep down, most of us obviously haven't committed murder, but we all want forgiveness for our sins, don't well, we? Well, that's really interesting. I think you're right. And I think perhaps that's why the dog collar does act as a conductor of something, because I think people do want absolution. I think also a lot of people want to be heard and aren't heard. I started my ministry in rural Lincolnshire, where um, people who live there are very often overlooked and have a, a reputation perhaps a bit taciturn and aren't people who speak very freely about their inner lives. But you find once you're ordained that they will speak to the padre, they will speak to the vicar um, in ways that are sort of just fascinating and you know it's so obvious but it's sometimes forgotten is interesting fascinating complex challenging lives are lived everywhere by all sorts of people in all sorts of places and also our impulses for good and ill and you know not not, yes. not infrequently but I was before I was in my, my, my parish I spent 11 years which was Findon rural parish in Northamptonshire I was in central London and a friend of mine said, well, gosh, you're going to go, it's all going to be, you know, bazaars and splat the rat and PCCs nowadays. 
won't you be a bit bored of the thinner diet that you'll get there? And in the first week of finding, we had a murder. So, you know, actually mm -hmm. it turned out to be quite lively. Well, Finden or um, the Chanton St. Mary, isn't it? The, the church. It's, it's sort of what uh, I think Colin Watson, who wrote a book called Snobbery and Violence in the 70s, called Mayhem Parva, which <laughs> is the little sleepy village where it all kicks off. And it's got a higher murder rate than downtown Detroit. <laughs> You know, kind of yeah. like Midsummer Murders on the television. Now, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, that, that Champton, you haven't actually said where it is, was that? No, I haven't. I mean, I, I was thinking it, of the brother comes from London and how, you know, trying to do little sums in my head, but you were quite clever. It could well, be anywhere. It's a it. Shire County in the middle of England. Right. And there is a clue, actually, but I'm not going to say what it is. Oh, OK. Where I'll it is. have and to also, go back and have another look now. But I, I, I wanted to sort of not be too too sort of um direct about that so you know uh, people can work it out if they want to they don't need to work it out and the other thing was about so i really wanted to set in the 1980s partly because i'm fascinated by the decade and what was happening there but also because it was 40 years and a bit after the end of the second world war yeah. and another thing that has come my way because of my ministry has been what happens to people when they suffer terrible trauma and 30 40 years pass there's some evidence, I think I was talking to someone the other day who's it's their academic field, was saying that there does seem to be this kind of long bake with traumatic experience and people who have suffered as, as, you know, as veterans of war or various other things. In my own life, sort of 35 years ago, it was the AIDS pandemic. Mm. Um, there, there's a point after maybe 30 years where you start to look at that again and stuff comes up. And I would often be at the deathbeds of people, you know, and I'm talking about, and often they were the people with the blazer and the neat moustache yeah, yes. who'd be bowling on a Sunday and reading yeah. the Express. Well, they've and been a group could... captain or something, yeah. war or something like that, yeah. Yeah, and you would discover that they'd been at Anzio or they yeah. had been in North Atlantic convoys or they had been in North Africa and the extraordinary stories of what they'd experienced and often what they had done. Mm. That was the stuff that was most charged, really. And stuff they'd never told anyone. Or perhaps they'd yeah. shared with veterans yeah. from the Legion, but they'd not shared with their yeah. families. Yes, because too difficult. Now, actually setting setting it in the 1980s, you kind of did yourself a favor because you don't have to worry about mobile phones, <laughs> yeah, or the internet, or you know, you could no one can say to anyone, oh, just Google it or anything like that. I mean, th those things aside, how did you find the technical aspects of making stuff up? I mean, I know you've written memoirs, obviously you've written sermons. It, it's different, isn't it? It is different, although some would say my memoirs read like fiction about which I say nothing. But no, it is completely different. I mean, partly it's because if you're writing nonfiction, you do have a check. You know, you can kind of um, measure what you're doing with the metric of what actually happened. And there are various ways of doing that. Although I think Mary Warnock said that memory and imagination are the same thing. Discuss. Um, but, but this is different because you're you're creating a world is too grandiose word for it but you are sort of creating a framework and putting some characters in it and seeing what they do and what surprised me more than anything was reading fiction is not the same as writing fiction so obvious but it was a kind of lesson i learned and relearned mm. and uh you would have, have an idea about what i was doing and then all of a sudden things went off in different directions and some things which i thought were promising turned out to be less promising that's just the other thing is you write, you learn how to write a novel by writing a novel, I think. Yes. So um, I'm really, I'm doing book two at the moment and um, I feel I'm sort of really fascinated now with what I've, what's changed since book, book one. Um, I well, suppose well, also... Yeah, I was going to say, can I ask, it's not, it's not meant to be an impertinent question at all, but um, now Daniel Clement does share certain things with you, uh, the lovely Daxons, um, uh, I don't know your mother, I've no idea, don't want to presume or anything. But there uh, there was um, a Catholic priest called Reginald Knox, who, Ronald Knox, sorry, God, Reginald, Ronald, not the Ronald. great Laura, Knox, Ronald Knox, who yeah. wrote this thing called the Decalogue, um, which members of uh, the Detection Club, which I'm sure Martin can tell us about later, have to sort of swear by, to abide by on pain of losing our sales. And now it's, it's quite precise and it says that there should be no preternatural, supernatural agency whatsoever so divine intervention or aid is out um the other what he doesn't mention 
but what a lot of people at the time thought was that the sleuth should have no uh, private life, uh. no relationship, no, because it would detract from the vocation, if you like, of solving crimes. And there are some secular, Hercule Poirot, for example, Jane Marple, they don't have anybody. And I think quite a lot of people got a bit fed up when Lord Peter Whimsey married Harriet Vane and so on, proposing to her in Latin, which was, you know, she still married him though. Um, uh, I just wondered, is Daniel going to, I, I got the impression that there was sort of scope for something there, but maybe I, I sort of, that was wishful thinking on my part. Well, I've got some ideas about what might yeah. happen to Daniel. And I mean, I think another thing that happened in the 1980s, and it happened particularly in the church, was that the love that dared not speak its name began at least to whisper it. Yes. And it was very interesting how that shaped and changed the lives of people I knew who were would be about the same age as Daniel. But I mean, I don't want to, I don't, I, there are twists and turns to that story, mm. as, I, as I imagine it. I think what was interesting about Monsignor Knox was, I'm interested that he said that he was so rigorous about that, that no supernatural fancy business, yeah. although actually I'm kind of interested in some of the supernatural fancy business, not as a kind of Bobby Ewing stepping out of the shower and all of his mm. obvious all been a dream, but actually the way it interacts with how you perceive things and how you think about things. So that's mm. one. And the other one is the, is the, the kind of, the silence around the private life because everyone has one after all mm. and, I, and i'm interested in how that silence began to break a little bit in that period and also what it does to, i mean i am not i'm really not everyone says oh he's like you because of the you know, common fact but actually he's a much more buttoned up person than me mm. and he's a much more punctilious person than me and i'm interested a bit in maybe how those buttons get undone and maybe done up again and anyway there's some button stuff happening yes now at this point i'd like to bring martin and john back in um and now i've just talked about about Knox, and we talk very slightly about really the serpent of murder that gets into this peculiarly british eden yes that, that is champton you know um, and obviously, as you pointed out, I mean, you've got a mystery that is set in the Arsenal football stadium and all sorts of other things, and they're not all in English villages, but there is something about, it's almost like it's an idea in our minds, isn't it? Is, do you remember when jo John Major in, I think, 1993 was talking about how we'll be in Europe, but we'll carry on being English, and he said that the old maids, he was quoting Orwell, said old maids cycling to church in the morning mist and the long shadows on the cricket ground. And even the people who mocked him and mocked he was, knew exactly what he was talking about. Yes. It is our Eden, isn't it? It, it, it is. Uh, and, and of course you, you do have this paradox, don't you? Because you have this, uh, this, this, at least superficially, very appealing, attractive, straightforward simple uh picture of this apparently idyllic world and yet of course even in the days of agatha christie uh bad stuff was happening um and sometimes even in agatha christie and, and, and other authors of that time that the, there are echoes of what's going on in the real world in in the novels it's it's not done explicitly but if if we think of two of the all-time classics uh, murder on the orange express and and then there were none um written at a time in history when the dictators were on the march in europe you have hitler mm. Mussolini, uh, and and things were looking pretty bleak you've had you've had the slump recession all that kind of thing so the 30s were not comfortable for many people despite these uh uh, uh, tropes that uh, that we think of, but uh, both those Christie novels, I think, have at their heart uh, quite a profound question, which is how do we do justice if the system of law lets us down and, and doesn't achieve justice? And that was, to me, very much uh, in keeping with what was going on in the world at the time. And it's woven in very artfully into classic detective fiction so that you don't really notice it, but but there's something... Yes, that, going... they, those two books rather give the lie to this idea that the world of the cosy or 
the golden age mystery because of course we had capital punishment then the right person will be caught and order will be restored and yeah. you know peace will reign this person will be dispatched by the hangman he cannot come back usually he not always he she cannot come back and wreak havoc ever again and that it's a comforting thing that, that's that's right and and yet yet when I listen to the points that Richard has been making, making, even within the context of a traditional mystery, there, are, there is serious stuff going on in the background. It, it may not be rammed down the reader's throat, but, but there are significant issues. And Richard, I, I think, touched on something that, that interests me a great deal and interested Agatha Christie a great deal. This idea of the way that that a, a murder, a terrible crime can affect a community. And of course, Christie wrote a book uh, uh, that specifically addressed this theme, Ordeal by Innocence. It, it's the suffering of the uh, innocent people who are suspected of this crime if the crime yeah. isn't cleared up. And, and that, that's, again, it, that, there's something quite profound about that and, and, and also something very true. Yeah. Oh, please, by the way, Rich and John, do absolutely fe feel free to, to come in on any of this, please. Yeah, I just want to say, if I could say something, which is that I was having a, an argument with someone the other day who uh, was talking about the kind of soft centre and hard centre approach to things, and that uh, really that it was uh, that it was not a rewarding strategy to uh, set murder mysteries in places with vicarages and churches and all that kind of thing, because it was an indulgence of nostalgia. And I had to point out, well, actually, that is my world. It's mm. not, a, it's not, it is actually I, a real world as yeah, well as I, a world in which we project our own. I world. think it's very interesting that well, the two words, they're kind of like conjoined twin words, and I wish they wouldn't go together as gritty realism. And it's very interesting that people will say, oh, the vicarage, that's not realistic. But they will accept that a serial killer is stalking <laughs> London, killing people in the manner of, I don't know, the 10 plagues of Egypt. But it's realistic because it's got a bit of police procedural and a bit of swearing. Yeah. It, 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 I, that absolutely baffles me. I think it, it's very odd and it's a, a very common misperception. And why <laughs> does realism have to be unpleasant? Stroking a cat is realistic and i think nice why, why why can't you have both that i find that very strange i mean Sorry. one of the things i've taken from the novels is it's just the detail that you get across and the sort of things that you would never ever be able to find in a history book and i i, I could perhaps start by richard's selection of 1980s biscuits which i was very pleased <laughs> to sort of revisit at one point but you know i've obviously my father was just born in the 1930s and the sort of the social history that you find that you know the author never knew that someone in 2022 was going to be reading this and just the way that that's you've got the moral issues but you've also got that social history detail which is just i think that does account for a certain amount of yes. what the crime classics does um but i think also you know there are certain titles within the crime classic series that are set in villages but something like progress of a crime is set in a village but it's actually about a motorcycle gang that you know um, go around and they're sort of they sort of james dean teddy boys and it's just, yeah. just the way that those things progress i think is you know in the range so the village does 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 appear but then you've got uh, you know the, the range of the series that martin was talking about earlier they it, it, it's not only britain for example there's there's international stories um there's one that's set in the houses of parliament you know it's i think there's there's also much that comes from this and that what you can do with classic crime and it's the, the murder before even song is the first one I've read from the, the 80s. And I think it's a fabulous way to sort of... yeah, But also you, you get the contrast, don't you? I mean, I think W.H. Auden wrote this essay called The Guilty Vicarage about how much he loved crime. Now, Auden, the man who said that slag heaps were his ideal scenery, said he would not read one unless it was set in rural England. <laughs> he that. They won't read it. So he would have loved yours. Um, Can I also just say, so, I'm sorry, um, there is an Arsenal game in my book too. The Arsenal oh. lose an FA Cup final of 1988. That's <laughs> <it>. <laughs> um, but Auden also said that it was the contrast. It was when like a dog makes a mess on a beautiful drawing room carpet is, is much more shocking than when a dog makes a mess in a dirty street. Yes. You know, that, 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 that's important as well. That, 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 that is a fact, and it, it is often said that the appeal, particularly of the traditional mystery, a, a term I, I prefer to cosy, uh, really, I think it's, it, it's a bit more accurate, um, uh, is, is this restoration of order. But, but if you look at quite a number of the uh, Golden Age novels, even by the likes of Christie, uh, you know, in the murder of 
murder on the Orient Express, the uh, uh, in, in one sense, the, the corporate isn't brought to justice, uh, in, in, in a sense. Um, and that's true in one or two of the other books as well. Why didn't they ask Evans, uh, uh, for instance? And I, I, I think that with crime fiction, there is something else going on. And I, I wonder if it helps to explain, contributes to explaining why during the pandemic, the enthusiasm for crime fiction has, has risen so much. Uh, all kinds of crime fiction, both Highsmith and and uh, and all the Golden Age books, and and to me, the question of dealing with uncertainty, crime mm. creates uncertainty. It's it's a disturbance. So even if, as in Patricia Highsmith, you don't get a a, a neat solution, these are these are not who done it. So they're they're not uh, conventional mysteries in any sense. But but the appeal to some extent is to see uh, a, a world disrupted perhaps permanently in the case of some individuals. And, and I, I do think that for, for most of us in the world, uh, I'd be interested to know what Richard thinks about this, for instance, uh, with, with the parishioners he's spoken to over many years. For most of us, uncertainty, disruption, change, uh, and in, in, indeed changes, I think mentioned right at the start of, uh, of Richard's uh, uh, novel. Um, this, this is very unsettling. And I think that if we look at crime fiction in a very broad way, the question of uncertainty is one of the things that connect different types of crime story in different ways. Crime authors are addressing it. And this is something that taps into what all of us uh, uh, wonder about. We've had a, a particular example with the pandemic and, and everything that that has brought. Uh, and of course, what's going on in the wider world at the moment as well. But, but uncertainty uh, is, is a feature in, in, in my way of thinking of so many crime novels, ranging from the Golden Age classics to the very dark novels of suspense. Yes, I, I, that, Richard, what do you think about that? Well, I think it's really interesting, actually. And, and I was thinking what you were saying. I, I, I love the, 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 you know, these classic mysteries. And it's just striking how many of them come from the 1930s. And this atmosphere of gathering tension and anxiety, because we know what's to come. They didn't know at the time. But all those wonderful um, novels which are set in country houses, where you just get the sense that there's having a last hurrah before Europe descends into chaos mm -hmm. and pandemonium. And, you know, it's perhaps not unthinkable that we might draw some comparisons of our own time. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why these books are so resonant with people, because precisely as you say, Martin, we live in a time of anxiety. And I'm, great, I'm, I'm a great admirer of the um, French sociologist and critic René Girard, who developed scapegoat theory, who um, argued that we compete for resources which are insufficient for our needs, and that creates tensions in whatever human society you care to look at, and that we need to earth those tensions. We do it by creating scapegoats that we send out into the community, um, and that earths the anxiety and allows us to return to some kind of functional order. And I think detectives and murderers kind of get some of their energy from that, really. But I think that resolution absolutely speaks to the sense we have of uncertainty and anxiety and how much that disrupts our lives. Do, do you also think that, that, you know, as you say, the, the uncertainty, there's a sort of element of self-soothing. I mean, I've always thought it wasn't an accident that really the beginning of the mysterious affair of styles, which is 1920, was it, Martin? Something yes, like that. Yeah. It, those books, they began to be very, very popular after the Great War, when there's everyone very traumatized. But it, at the same time as the development of and fascination with the crossword, Yes. a morally neutral puzzle and now yeah. of course we're all mad about wordle and yeah. you know spin-offs and i can't help feeling that we're in the sort of self-soothing where there's maybe some kind of link but, and there's something more i'd say is that resolution is imperfect because actually what's happened has i remember a fascinating conversation with a a guy who came to see me who was an armed police officer had been and we were talking about he'd been involved in a notorious episode where someone had been killed actually by him and uh, we were just talking about what that was like and he was saying oh well you know you, it's training so you are trained to do it and you do what you have to train and everything was done by the book so he had nothing to trouble his conscience after it although 
clearly he did. But he said something at the end of it, he just as an aside, he said, once you've killed someone, nothing is ever the same again. Hmm. You can't undo that. No, and there's resolution, but actually we're changed by stuff and that resolution might be shaky. Yes, that actually that was something else I was I was going to ask about the old fashioned mystery, let's call it that. Um, and the rise again, I think, of the amateur sleuth, because up until ooh, certainly 10 years ago when I, I started, which was in the last century, they were people were very sneery about them. And now they're everywhere. And I do wonder if that's maybe also something to do with the fact that the police in this country, their reputation has become, shall we say, somewhat tarnished. Um, and I know various people I know who, who write police procedurals sort of saying, oh, this makes me rather uncomfortable, the idea of this, this hero. Yes, and, and, and I, I, I think also, and, and Richard has again alluded to this in, in connection with his own book, that, um, that the sheer uh, reliance on technology uh, 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 today um, complicates any uh, account of police procedure in detail. It's perfectly possible to do it, and, and, and we know many wonderful writers who do it superbly. But for many other writers, uh, it can be a bit daunting, and sometimes yeah. the search can get in the way of the story and characterization. So uh, I, I think that, uh, as you've said, Laura, uh, one uh, uh, way of squaring the circle is to bring back the amateur. Another connected uh, option is is to go for the historical uh, mystery, mm. where not got the same technological issues. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm assuming most of the the books in the British Library series are amateur detective rather than, or, or is that not right? Just the other way around, I think. It's, We've yeah. got more police. It's, oh, it, detective yeah. Staff, Inspector MacDonald and the like. Yes, very much so. Um, just mm. scanning across. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder and if there's something yeah, that, 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 that you think of all those stories about Agatha Christie in particular, where the police are rather kind of ploddish and dull of wit. And I just wonder sometimes that now, where we have a highly bureaucratized police force and the kind of interventions to create those resolutions that people seek, often they're much more ambiguous than that now. And I wonder if there's a sort of way in which the amateur sleuth finds a way forward through that, because the police are so restricted in what they can do in terms of delivering the sort of exciting resolution that we want. So they're too busy filling in their forms or, uh, you know, then kind of um, getting stuck in. I don't know. Yes, oh, I suppose back in the day there was more class deference. So you got the tough detective yeah. telling the police what to do and it's saying, oh, yes, Governor, you've solved the case. And it's all all sort of wonderful. But, the rise of forensics yeah, so well, what you mean. contributing to that. I think the rise of forensics, where you can actually find these things out in a slightly different way, or you know, the science technology is again, mobile phone yeah. is um, as a not necessarily the same way as deduction. <laughs> yes. Now, Martin, actually, there's something I wanted to ask you, which sort of touches on that: is what are the the criteria? for choosing a crime classic. I mean, obviously there are issues there with the copyright and who owns what and so on and so forth. But yeah. I was thinking about looking at all these books with the beautiful covers, the branding is so on point, it's brilliant. And then I was thinking about a British author, in fact, although you wouldn't know it, something like No Orchids for Miss Blandish, yeah. famously sort of sadistic sexual violence. And I think it got toned down, but I read the original and was shot the pants <laughs> off me. I mean, Crikey, and it does not have a happy ending. No. Um, what about something like like that? I mean, that was super popular in 1940 at a time when you think everyone was getting quite enough sex and violence at home. You know, there's <laughs> war, you're being bombed. But 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 as somebody pointed out that actually the what they used to call the action story was maybe because in war, actually rather like in COVID, we were you can be very passive. You know, you're sitting there in a trench waiting for a bond to fall on you or, you know, sort of carrying a narrow shelter or whatever. And you want to be the action person. You, you know, you want to identify, you want to be doing something or at least reading about somebody doing something. Yes, yes. Well, it's so there are two questions in one, Martin. I'm sorry. It, 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 it's, it's, you know, that, you're, you're absolutely right. It's certainly true that, that, for instance, the Second World War changed things and it definitely changed the uh, direction of travel of the crime novel it is not that 
um, golden age style stories ceased to be written because Christie carried on writing, Lorac, uh, and, and many others, uh, Nio Marsh. But, but a, a new type of uh, uh, writing emerged where in the wake of the Holocaust, the horrors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, readers were increasingly interested and writers were interested uh, in, in exploring uh, what, what drives someone to, to do something truly evil. And this was a change from the reaction that you mentioned earlier to the mm -hmm. First World War, when after that terrible slaughter, people wanted to have fun and do the crossword mm -hmm. puzzles and so on. It, it, was, it was a different kind of reaction for perfectly uh, uh, rational historical reasons. And in the series, to, to, to address your other question, what, what we've tried to do um, is to showcase a range of different types of books, ranging from late 20s right up to the late 60s. And so you have people like Julian Simmons, John mentioned mm -hmm. the prototype of a crime, which is actually based quite closely on a real life miscarriage of justice. Some, some young uh, uh, boys uh, uh, killed somebody on Clapham Common and okay. all celeb at the time. And Simmons fictionalized this in, in, in a pretty impressive way, uh, uh, a prize winning book. Um, and that is quite a different type of story, even though it's got a good plot from the type of story that uh, uh, characteristically was being written in the 1930s and, and of course Christie was still writing at that time but we're interested in this series I've mentioned Mary Kelly and um, Due to a Death which is a particularly remarkable book from the uh, uh, 60s and um, quite different I did wonder when I, I tentatively suggested it to to John and Johnny whether it would be uh, acceptable uh, as a story because it is so dark and so different from so many of the traditional mysteries in, in, in the series. But uh, I'm, I'm delighted they, they took it on board. And it, it, it's been very well received because it is a, a really beautifully crafted and well-written example of a different way of addressing uh, uh, moral issues, character issues within the context of a detective story. And there is actually a private detective in it uh, veering on an amateur detective, but, but he's, he's by professional private detective uh, in, in this story. So I think that this uh, is quite a good example of the range that John and I were talking about earlier, that in looking to uh, um, maintain and enhance reader enthusiasm for the series, which has been so great mm. uh, across the world, I do think it's important to focus on two things. First of all, quality, as mm. far as you yeah. want good stories. And secondly, uh, range. So it's not just the same old, same old. There are things that I would like to think even the really seasoned crime fan won't expect to come yes. along. With and actually in the, the 60s, you say, it's sort of the Cold War era, mm. I always associate that with a lot of spy novels. Mm. Are, you, mm. are you getting those as well? I mean, I think if you're sort of thinking, oh my God, we've got to do a drill and if the wrong person presses a button, <laughs> our bones will be turned to lace. In fact, that's yeah. quite stressful. In fact, there's basically no period of the 20th century which wasn't totally stressful, really, <laughs> <laughs> thinking about it. Um, but do, have you been do, doing those as well? I think with well, the series and with something like Mary Kelly in general, and, and actually this Julian Simmons, we're, we're just pushing things in certain directions and just seeing how, what the reaction is. And obviously, you know, we're driven by sales as well. We have to be. And I think, you know, we're, we're always having conversations about new particular ways to go. And I think, you know, there have, there have been ones, but, you know, about thrillers and, and spies. Well, it's just how we fit that into a, what is called the British Library Crime Classics and whether, you know, yeah. whether that would work. But, um, it's wonderful to sort of have that and have this sort of measure and what works and it's and we're not solely publishing certainly not to in terms of numbers we're publishing because we're a public institution mm -hmm. and we want to you know delve down into the, the units of this building and find what's there and bring it out for the first time in you know 70 yeah. years and, um, it's like a, the book equivalent of a diamond mine or something <laughs> it's wonderful well it, it, it is and you know um, the, the reason we're we're doing this obviously on, online is because the, the, you can't get to the basements because of the, <laughs> the <laughs> problem and they're all closed because of the um the problems we've been having um but yes i mean it 
it's an absolute privilege to come in here and realize that, you know, I mean, I, I sort of laugh when we're in the publishing team, you know, it's, we're a good publishing team with not a bad library attached. <laughs> <laughs> well, indeed. What I love about them so much, it, it, it's the texture of that life in the 1930s. I mean, obviously, the technically accomplished, some of them are very, I love the John Bude, I think, I think they're terrific. The Cheltenham Square, but that's him, isn't it? Which I yeah. love, but uh, but it's the texture. And one of the things we're trying to do is to recreate 1988. You can do all the things. You can do the biscuits. You can do the Arsenal Luton game. You can do all that stuff. What did it feel like? What were we worried about? What were our fears? That's the stuff that really interests me. I think the mood. Yeah, yeah I, I'm also struck actually by how readers from that period, um, the the what they expect you to know. I remember reading in the is it the Floating Admiral, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah. the first one, which is this tag team story by members of the Detection Club. And Canon, whoever it is, who you'll be able to tell me, clearly thinks that you'll know what the seventh commandment is. <laughs> this is just, you know, we should all know this. And I found myself sort of scratching my head. And I just, it's very interesting. I must confess, yeah. look, Things like that. I was in a church and somebody just said I've broken the fifth commandment and I couldn't remember a second which one it was, which would have had a considerable bearing on the, how serious the offence was, if there indeed there was one, but it was OK in the end. Yes, I mean, I know giving giving cheek to your mum and dad is a bit different to murder. And Yes, yeah. but it falls very close to adultery in the list, and you have to remember which one's which, or you might get your angle of approach very drastically wrong. <laughs> that would be a major faux pas, wouldn't it? That would, that would be dreadful. <laughs> um, the, but it would be a good plot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it would actually, it would be a brilliant jumping off point for a plot. Um, I, I think we have to wrap up quite soon, but what... Uh, Martin, what what you have you did mention um, a couple of titles. What are your particular favourites? In the series, what's the one you would press into somebody's hand and insist <laughs> they read? Well, well, well. In terms of uh, personal prejudice, I would say the Poison Chocolates Case by Anthony Barclay, which is a book I've I've loved since I was a teenager. And I think um, of of all the others, it is of course really hard to pick. But uh, I've I've got a very soft spot for a book that's done very well uh, by Michael Gilbert called Smallbone Deceased. Michael was a uh, was a, a solicitor, uh, and Smallbone Deceased is set in a solicitor's office, and you know, that's a pretty dull setting. But it, it's a wonderfully witty and incredibly entertaining and clever novel, and and I've I've been overjoyed by uh, the reception that it's received since it's come back into print. Right, oh, that's lovely. Um, John, how about you? Do you have personal favourites? I've only been in post here for about four years, so I haven't actually gone back and read all of the hundred because I've got so much else to read. We'll, we'll let you through. off. We're forgiving. But, no, you don't. I'm not being let off. But I, I suppose <laughs> probably the one that I really enjoyed the most so far is um, the Division Bell Mystery by Ellen Wilkinson, which is is the one that's set in the Houses of Bo Houses of Parliament with the intriguing kind of murder and the sort of just what that tells you about that particular time. Ellen was the first female MP and we were delighted to welcome Rachel Reeves to the library to our what, the code conference we do called Bodies in the Library, which we're doing tomorrow. And she gave a presentation on Ellen and the histories of MPs, you know, women MPs. And I, yeah. All the mix of that just said to me, that's what, what a fantastic thing that the library should be publishing. Yeah. And Richard, do you have favourites from that period? I mean, whether or not they're in the list, but... Well, in this series, I think the Cheltenham Square murder is... A, I didn't know John Bude's writing at all, and I, I think he did the Sussex Downs murder as well, yeah. which I uh, like very much too. But I like that because it was interesting as the way he kind of created almost a village within a city, This the way the, the, the square kind of worked as a sort of frame within a frame, which I thought was, was fascinating. I think I've just been rereading Nio Marsh, who I love. My grandmother loved Nio Marsh. And uh, I'm, what's the one, um, the theatre one, set in the theatre? Oh, I'm of an age now where I can't remember the title of anything. But um, the, 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 the way her two, her overlapping lives as a crime writer and also as a director of theatre um, met and uh, in a happy way, I thought that was fascinating. Opening night. That's it, that's it, yeah. yeah. The, my my one of my favourites in the British Library series, at least I think it's one of yours, is is Green for Danger by yes. Christiana Brand, which is set in the hospital, which is very very clever. I love that, and I also, although I don't think you publish it, um, Malice of Forethought by Francis Isles, uh, who may uh, actually be Anthony Barclay. Is he? 
He is. The same, the same guy. <laughs> yeah. same, right? yeah, a terrific writer who, who was so innovative. Everything he, he wrote, there was something different about it and something usually groundbreaking. It's quite remarkable. Yeah. And, of course, Miles of Forethought is a genuine classic. Yeah. Extraordinary. And, and based on a real case, I think. Yes, yes, well, the Armstrong case. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, OK, I think we've got sort of four minutes. Martin, can you just very quickly explain about the Detection Club? Being very careful, obviously, because if you reveal secrets, you will... <laughs> game, basically. I'll be uh, expelled. Yeah. The Detection Club was the world's first social network of, of crime writing. It was founded in 1930 by Anthony Barclay, we've just been speaking about, um, assisted by Dorothy L. Sayers and Ronald Knox, we've we've spoken about earlier. Uh, and um, it was a small um, self-selecting uh, group of writers who wanted to elevate the standards of the detective story and the literary standards. They were they were ambitious. Okay. And um, this was a time when when writers didn't didn't know each other. So it was also convivial. It meant a great deal to the people. Uh, and that and you mentioned the Floating Admiral, the book they wrote collaboratively. And we've continued to produce uh, books over the years. You've collaborated. Uh, yes. I remember struggling greatly with my chapter in The Sinking Admiral. Yes, thanks for yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so so the Detection Club thrives to this day. It's still a small uh, group of writers uh, and, and it's it's purely a social uh, club, but it's uh, it's great fun. And, and it's now a part of British crime writing heritage, rather like the crime classics. Yes, and it is fair to say that past and present and whatever they write, crime writers are some of the most convivial and friendly and supportive people <laughs> that you'll ever meet. So on that note, thank you very much, Reverend Coles. Thank you, Martin Edwards and, jo and John Lee. Thank you thank very you. much. Thank, thank you, and thank you, Laura, for being such a fantastic host with a really, really interesting set of questions that really got some... some really oh, you're welcome. Down. We could talk on this subject all night. It's, what, it's a wonderful topic. I just wanted to conclude by saying that um, Martin's magnificent book, The Life of Crime, which has just been published, which is breathtaking in terms of its the depth and the range, is available from the British Library shop, along with all of the British Library crime classics and, of course, Murder Before Even Stung by the Re Reverend Richard Coles. Um, and there's a tab at the bottom, at the top of this screen um, to, to, to go to the shop and obviously purchase these. But thank you, everybody. Thank you for a lovely evening and um, really, really wonderful to wrap this one up. And thank you all. Bye bye. <laughs>